During our first uh, interview, we talked about setting up the orchestra. Yeah. Um, did you have to work on it for the recordings? And if yes, what what did you do? What sort of work and rearrangement did you have to do? Setting up an orchestra is a sort of a, a balancing act between ideals and realities. Um, so, for instance, I came in to the first sessions with a real ideal image of how I wanted the orchestra sat. I wanted the violins on one on one side, one on the other side. I wanted double basses behind the winds. I wanted timpani on the side behind the trumpet. I wanted the horns and trombones in one line at the back. And I had very clear, distinct musical reasons for why I wanted this to happen. However, when we got into the hall and those particular players, we started changing around a bit because it's a balance between the idea of how you imagine the music working, but also how the hall works, how the acoustics work, how the microphones work. But even more importantly, it's how the individual players of the orchestra work. And so, for instance, in Hodinot Hall, we found that it was quite hard for the violins on either side of the conductor to hear each other. Not impossible, but what it did was it made them very uncomfortable and very nervous. And so in order to get them to relax, to feel relaxed and comfortable and to play the best they could, I moved the violins back. Now, I lost a little bit in this sort of stereo, one violin sound, the other violin sound. But what I gained was a depth of sound, uh, an intonation, an ensemble, a happy violin or a happier violin section. And so little things like that, um, it's always a, 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 a matter of compromise or a matter of negotiation. Um, some of the things as well, we, we, uh, we moved the contrabassoon, which is the big bass uh, bassoon, behind the bassoons. Normally they're in one line. But... Um, both for the microphones, for the hall, and importantly for the player, he felt more confident fulfilling the role in this music of that instrument because the contrabassoon is actually used almost as a solo bass instrument. And you often get the cellos playing the bass line and only the contra playing the low 16 foot. And so for Phileas the producer and for the player, it was a much better place for him to be which was unusual. I would never suggest that to an orchestra and that suggestion came from the player. It was fantastic. So I think it's also really important um, to, to understand where you want the sound to sound best. And for these recordings, that was of course in the box. Um, two of the symphonies we did play live and then it was a matter of making it sound really good in the hall and in the box. But when you came along for the fourth symphony, I mean, it did sound good in the hall, but we didn't ever go back and listen in the hall or think, how does it sound from row three? How does it sound from row 50? All we did was we listened through the microphones and we adjusted the microphones and the players and where I was. And there were certain things which I heard too much of or too little of. So even for, for me as a conductor, it wasn't... I mean, you never want it to sound perfect here. I mean, if it does, it's very wonderful. And there are some halls where it does and it sounds great out there. But there are other halls where you have to make the translation. And so for me, I, I would go back every day into the recording studio. So we have a main orchestral studio and then behind there's a recording box with the, with the sound desk and speakers and to speak to Vilius and to listen to the sound so that I could then make the translation in my head. So I'd know in this passage, I need much more viola than sounds right, because in the box that will sound good, or I need less of that, or I don't need to worry that I can't hear the harps because they're picked up really well in the box. One thing really striking during the recordings was the difference in dynamics. And that's what we talked about. Yeah. Um, You could perceive much more dynamics in the hall, but it was clear, but not as clear as in the studio. Yeah. And in the studio, there was way less dynamics, but you could understand or hear 
better every instrument. Yeah. Um, I know you also mentioned, or we mentioned that um, Hot in a Hole is probably best for recording yeah. and rehearsing, not so much for performance yeah. to an audience. Um, I mean, have you have you been? An so audience, I, I have done concerts, audience? and it's lovely for an audience. You feel very close to the orchestra. Um, it's quite a small hall for a concert hall, so you get this very immediate sound. It's very sort of crisp and clear. Um, and I both sat in the audience there and I've done concerts there and it's wonderful and it's a great experience, but it's built as a recording studio. And so it sounds best or it works really, really well in the box. But I mean, we, 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 we were chatting about this recording is not live music. It's a reproduction of live music. And for me, it's actually almost a completely different art form. And classical music in particular, but other sorts of music, but classical music in particular is a live art form. You need to hear it in an acoustic. You need to somehow hear the wood of the violin vibrating and the wood of the hall or the, the wood of the seat vibrating. And you need to be there surrounded by living people in silence and in darkness and sort of you, you soften into the experience and your ears go out onto the stage. And that's where you get this incredible, tangible, almost, well, definitely physical connection with the musicians on stage, with the composer. And it's like you build this bridge between you and someone who, who is different from you, who is another. And I think that, that that's really unique in classical music. And I think the more that we we fight for that and show it and draw people into that, the stronger classical music will be. Of course, recording then is something different and something is absolutely lost. I 100% agree and I didn't go into these recordings trying to emulate that live performance because I don't think you can. So I before before doing this, I... I thought long, long and hard, and I read a lot about the philosophy of recording and the experience of recordings, and I listened to, I mean, I, I've always listened to recordings, and I have thousands of vinyl LPs and CDs, and my flat is basically books, CDs, and LPs. You think I'm exaggerating? I'm not. Literally piles everywhere. I saw a glimpse of, of the room of <laughs> yeah. the office. It's a I bit can mad. Confirm. Um, but I really wanted to to have a meaning and a reason for creating these recordings. And actually it was very interesting going through the process that for the different symphonies that changed depending on what the symphony was expressing. What you do in a recording is that you're, you're given a canvas on which to construct something which, wh wh whose job or which, the job of which is to move people and create emotions in them through the medium of recording. So what you can do is you can balance things, you can create, I want to not use the word perfect because perfect in recording is actually a, a bad word, but really consistent uh, lines which are unbroken and uncompromised at all. And that's what you look for in a recording and that's what we were looking for in the orchestra. And it's not just there on the surface or it's not just there if you choose to listen to the violins or the double basses. It's there whatever you listen to. I don't think I will ever live up to that ideal, but it's something to really aim at and wherever we come will be, will be strengthened by that. One thing I was quite interested to know is, obviously, because we acousticians... Um, suggest a lot of options and variable options for acoustics. Uh -huh. How did you work on the acoustics of the Hardinet Hall during the recordings? There were there's quite a few options. Obviously, there's the curtains all around the, yeah. the stage. There's uh, more curtains at the back. There's so there was some um, uh, some sliding panels as well yeah. as uh, at the top. Um, and there's diffusion on the walls all around, so that's pretty good for the um, 
Yeah. Uh, the musicians, but also to avoid any flutter echoes. Um, and yeah, so it's quite, it would be quite interesting to know how you use it and if you use it, because we do think a lot about it. We do do a lot of calcs, but how actually, how much do you use that? I mean, absolutely we used it. Um, I mean, the first thing is that it was super important for me that these recordings sounded like they were in a space, that they're not, you know, I didn't want a completely dead room and then you add reverb. So there were no sort of added effects or, you know, electronic additions or things like that. So I really wanted to situate the orchestra in a space and Phileas, our producer, gets this extraordinary sort of three-dimensional sound where you really hear the strings, the winds, the brasses, the timpani, and you feel like there is real distance but closeness at the same time. Often, you know, when we were sitting there, I would talk about, oh, do you think we could move the sound so that the person listening is sitting three rows forward or four rows back, or that's how I talked about it. So the within the Hot or Not Hall, I did, or we talked about... Um, for instance, we opened the curtains because we didn't want the deadness. We wanted the the liveness of the hall. Um, for some of the symphonies, but not all of them, depending on the size of the orchestra, we opened the the big shutters at the top to again create more volume and more more reverberance in the space. Um, but a bit like the orchestral seating. You have, a, you have an ideal sound in mind. And there are various paths to get there. And changing the acoustics of the hall is, of course, one of them. But, of course, another of them is you play differently. And um, another is you microphone differently. So it was very much a sort of a negotiation between all the parties and working out what, again made the orchestra feel most comfortable um working out what made the microphone sound best and what made the space sound best and if you had more time you might experiment with more with different ways of getting the same result um but i think i think the control is very important because you you change the playing, you change the microphones, and then you're left somewhere and it's like, ah, I still can't get this. Okay, let's open those. Okay, then you change the playing, you change the microphones. Ah, we've got it. So, of course, the hall is the biggest thing and the slowest thing to move. The players are the quickest thing to move. So you start with the players, then you do the microphones, and then you do the hall. So having that flexibility is hugely important almost even if you don't use all of it. The other thing that was quite striking was the size of the volume of the Hardinot Hall. Yeah. And we don't see it from, because there's the re reflectors, the overhead reflectors in the way. But when you step on top, go on top of the audience and you look at the volume, it's just massive and it feels like there's even double volume from... Yeah, from the floor to the um, the reflectors, you seem you feel like they're the same height above, and it's it's so important for to control the volume of the orchestra. And when you when we listen to the orchestra, it didn't feel loud at all around or yeah. within the orchestra. So it was it was quite incredible. Obviously, yeah. you could play really really loud, and we did perceive it and made us jump. Yeah. Uh, but then you could really control the level. And I guess it's also a way to not have music sound too loud and prevent hearing loss. Well, I mean, the hearing loss is very important. And I think uh, the BBC are very careful and uh, I think they have a pretty good setup there. But um, when we talked last time in the, in the blog, um, I mentioned that I love working in smaller concert halls because it or it makes players or I can encourage players to play a little bit less and go for the reverberance in the sound, which for me is a slightly more authentic, older approach to making sound where the sound sort of spins out of the instrument. 
And you're not trying to project the back of a 6,000-seater hall. You're trying to make the most perfect sound for the moment, expressive sound, where you are. Um, and that was one of the things I love about Hodenot Hall is that you can play softer, particularly in the louder sections. And you probably heard me, I kept, well, not I kept, but I, I asked many times for the strings, the winds, and particularly the brasses to play more gently, take one dynamic volume down, because then you get this richer, warmer, um, more analog, more... Um, materialistic sound like you can hear the materials of the instruments um, and you hear real reverberation and warmth in it not all music needs or wants or demands that but schmidt absolutely there was a i used it in the rehearsals there's a beautiful saying in a in a book by stefan zweich who was also an austrian author of the same sort of time as schmidt and he described there was an old hall in uh, vienna called the buzz and the Bösendorfer Saal, which I think was bombed, so it no longer exists. But he describes the sound there in a very sort of beautifully poetic way as sounding like you're inside a dusty old violin. And I thought that was beautiful, and that's how I want it to sound, sort of with this, with this sort of almost tender um, fragility to the sound, even when it's strong and powerful. And I think that that space and having that, that physical volume above and having the microphones meant that we didn't have to blast. We never had to play out, um, which means that you can find more colors. It's like speaking. You know, if you have to shout, you have only a certain color range. But if you can shout and speak and whisper, suddenly you have all of these colors to play with. <laughs> 